Acts chapter 18. We're talking about a uh, church that doesn't have any authority to be a church and a church that doesn't have any uh, authority to baptize. And we see this. And one of the great spokesmen or pastors of this church was Apollos. Apollos. Apollos of Alexandria. Alexandria was a, uh, uh, well, first of all, we're in Ephesus now. There's 300,000 people in Ephesus. This is the eastern seat of the Roman Empire, so to speak, right there in, in Asia, the, the Asian seat of the Roman Empire. The most important place in the Roman Empire is Ephesus. It's a tremendous city, a rich city. And uh, Apollos is over here, and Apollos is from Alexandria, Egypt, where the largest library in the world, I believe, if I remember right, this is by memory, but I think there were 700,000 volumes of uh, books in the Alexandrian library before Islam burned them, when Abu Barker went in and burned them. Uh, they destroyed it and said there wasn't anything important except for the Quran. <laughs> So anyway, they went in and, and burned all those uh, volumes in, in Alexandria, Egypt. But Alexandria, Egypt had 600,000 people, 300,000. And now, you know, Bakersfield's almost 400,000. So you cram all the people in Bakersfield, and that's what was in the Ephesus. Now you take twice that many people, and that's what is in Alexandria, Egypt. And in Alexandria, Egypt, the population there, there was 25% of the population in Alexandria, Egypt, were Jewish. A lot of the Jews went down into Egypt. We have in, in uh, when Sheba went down there, the Queen of Sheba, she took a, a facsimile of the Ark of the Covenant. She took Judaism with her. And some of those Jews, you know, after the last 20, 30 years, are going back into Israel because they say we're Jews. They're leaving their country because of Islam. Islam has killed people devastated every country in the Middle East and all over the world. Now, let's go here and, and see what's happening in this subject today. The subject today is a, uh, a, a church that has no authority and no baptism. And unscriptural baptism, that's the authority. We, now, we studied this a little bit more, but now we're right on subject. 23... Verse number 23, and having spent some time, and it literally in, in Greek it means having rubbed out time, killing time, mm -hmm. killing time. He departed and passed successfully, uh, successively through Galatia region and uh, Phrygia and strengthened all of the disciples. Now, every time they say disciples here, what does it mean? Churches. churches. Strengthen the churches. The churches are made up of disciples, true disciples. Now, every one of these churches had scriptural baptism, did they? Paul, he came out, was a representative of what church? He went from Jerusalem to Antioch, and he, every place he went, he built churches, and he ordained elders and deacons and servants in all of these churches, and he's building churches. We keep thinking about, I want you to get that universal idea of church and think of local invisible churches. That's what the only kind there really were. The word Catholic or universal church came in with the Catholicism, and we, and we borrowed it from uh, Protestantism and used it in our works, but it does, there is no such thing as a universal church. There, that, that's a, a figment of Catholicism's imagination and all of the rest, Presbyterian. Methodist, all of them. They talk about the universal church as being all the same. The universal church is not all the same. We talked about the other night, I believe it was, uh, on Sunday night, we talked about the Hebrew wedding. We talked about the Hebrew wedding and the bride of Christ. Now a certain Jew named Apollos. What does Apollos mean? In Revelation it talks about another person, Apollyon, which is from the same word. What's Apollyon mean? You remember what Apollyon means? How many of you remember when I talked about the doctrine of Satan? Destroyer. It means to completely destroy and tear apart. Apollos means the same thing. It's got an Omicron Sigma on the end of it. That's nominative singular masculine. Okay. Here we have Apollos, which means destroyer. Now, that's a Greek name. Okay. That's a Greek name. He is from what we call a, um, an area in Egypt where we have the... Uh, Hellenistic Jews. 
Hellenistic Jews. Now, the Hellenistic Jews did not study Hebrew. They studied only Greek, the Greek Septuagint. The Greek Septuagint was translated in Alexandria, Egypt. And when they looked at the scriptures, they looked at it through Greek without comparing it to Hebrew. When uh, <clears throat> whoever the writer was, and I think it was Apollos that wrote the book of Hebrews, he made some mistakes in his theological uh, pictures, not taking away from the inspiration of the book of Hebrews, but he looked at it as a Hellenistic Jew. Now, when God inspired these people to write the Bible, he used their personalities, didn't he? Personality of Isaiah, personality of James, personality of Paul and all of these. And so they wrote it in their words, but they wrote it as inspired of God. These were instructions. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus. If you want to read uh, a perfect, absolute perfect Greek treatise, that's the book of Hebrews. That's why many of the Greek scholars believe that Apollos wrote that book because he was an eloquent. This man was a scholar. You know what a scholar is? That's somebody who studies all the time, a lot. Okay? And he was mighty in the scriptures. <clears throat> now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what other people say about Apollos because they don't know what the church is. <clears throat> Apollos, I believe, was a saved man. Nothing wrong with his salvation. He's sal saved by grace. There's a lot of people out in unscriptural churches today saved by grace. If anybody's ever going to get to heaven, they're going to be saved by grace. I can guarantee you that much. Without any works, not too long ago, I was preaching on the radio. Sometimes I'll get a chance to preach an hour, two hours, 15 minutes or whatever. This night I preached a lot. And I was out there <clears throat> giving some of the testimonies of some of the people that that were Catholics that were saved and, and when they came into salvation by grace they were absolutely thrilled to realize that they could go to bed that night and if they died they're going to be with the Lord but Brother Bill you know what I'm talking about security and real true salvation and they were so happy and this guy came on the radio and he said uh, I, I, I really like to hear you but you're bashing Catholicism I said, no, I'm not bashing Catholicism. I said, all I'm doing is telling. I said, I'll tell church history, and I'll just tell it the way it is. I bash Catholics. I bash Lutherans. I bash Presbyterians. I bash Baptists. <laughs> because there's a lot of places in church history that Baptist is wrong, and I will not fail to say that. Will I? I always tell the truth about church history. That's it. One guy said here a while back, he said, when I used to hear you preach, he said, I just took it hook, line, and sinker. Because every time I checked you out, it was the truth. He says, well, when you say something, I believe it. <laughs> I said, boy, I wish you'd check me out a little bit more. <laughs> like that, but he said, I know you are a scholar. You study these things. Well, anyway, I was preaching here like this, and uh, this guy was a Catholic. I think he might have been a priest. Well, anyway, I went on like that, and he said, well, Catholicism is like a three-legged stool. And you Baptists sit on a one-legged stool, like the old milking stool, you know what I'm talking about? A lot of people don't know what that means. It's a one-legged stool. You just set it underneath you with a handle on it, you milk the cow and pull it out. No three legs, just one. Catholicism likes like a three-legged stool. One is the bride, the church. The other one is the, uh, the dogmas of the Catholic Church, and the other is the sacraments, and it takes all three of them to go to heaven. And I said, well... There's not any Baptist going to get to heaven without salvation by grace. No Catholic get to heaven without salvation by grace. But I mean, I went on for like two hours. I preached from Genesis through Revelation. <clears throat> salvation, great. Ephesians 2 and 8. For in grace you are having been saved. It's a done deal. And then, when I got through after all this preaching, God puts one other thing on my heart. And I said, now, I said, if anybody's out there, that doesn't know the Lord right now. I said, how would you like to be able to go to bed tonight and know that you're going to be with the Lord tomorrow if you die or tonight? I said, you want to do that? Do you want to do that? And I said, it is believe in Jesus Christ as the only mediator between man and God, not priests, not Mary, not anybody, not me, no one else. 
Believe in him, ask him to forgive your sins, repent of them, and ask him to save your soul. And that one of the gifts that you have today is a gift of faith. By faith you're saved. By faith you're saved. I said, how would you like to know that? And, I, and he, he says, I believe in the dogmas of the Catholic Church and the Holy Roman Church and the sacraments of the church. And talk about a letdown. But I'll tell you one thing. He heard the gospel. He heard the gospel. Now this person right here, when he hears the truth about God's word, he doesn't say, I want to hold on to what I got. I'm going to take that to hell with me. Let's see what Apollos does here pretty soon, okay? Let's see what his answer to the truth was. We're in Acts, the 18th chapter, and verse number 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. Now remember, there's 300,000 people population in Ephesus, 600,000 in Alexandria. The greatest library in the world at this time was still in Alexandria. And this is a very educated man, and he's a preacher of the gospel. And he's preaching the gospel, and people are getting saved. Now, half of the Protestant world will say that Apollos wasn't saved. But he was. He preached repentance, and he preached in looking toward Jesus. Brother Bill. Tim, I know that the Vatican has, has a great library. I've read that over 85 miles of shelves. Yeah. Alexandria has a... Has a Alexandria had 700,000 volumes. I don't know how big it was, but these are big volumes back in there. But it's gone. No, Islam burned it. When Islam went into Egypt, they burned the whole library. They got away with it. Well, who, 20, else, who else in the world has a library besides the Vatican? Well, the Vatican now has a very large library. Let's go on verse number 25 now. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. What does it mean, the way of the Lord? What is the way? That's Jesus. And being fervent in spirit, he was speaking of teaching and accurately the things concerning Jesus. Did he say this? Now, half of the people say, well, he just didn't know Jesus. He didn't know about the Savior had come and died. Because John the Baptist, I've read this in great big commentaries, okay? Big shot commentaries. That he, did, he wasn't saved, he didn't, didn't know, but what does the Bible say? Did he know the way of Jesus? Did he know truth and salvation? But the person that wrote the, the commentaries didn't know what scriptural baptism or church authority was either. That's their problem. It's not mine, okay? It's their problem. He was speaking, teaching accurately. That word accurately means he's cutting exactly straight, precisely. The things concerning Jesus being acquainted only with the baptism of John. What was wrong with John's baptism? Nothing was wrong with John's baptism. John had a baptism from where? His authority was from where? Jesus said heaven. Or among man, he, he asked the Jews, he said, was his baptism from heaven or men? And they were afraid to say because then they, he would say, you're going to be, go be baptized by him. But John the Baptist, when Jesus came on the scene, what did John the Baptist say? I must decrease, he must increase. But you know, those, those disciples were following John. Some of those disciples didn't want to follow Jesus. They went ahead and followed John, and they built churches, unscriptural <laughs> churches, without any foundation. Jesus called out his church, and it was in existence when he was in his, on this earth. He found that, and that church built more churches. Now, here we have a scriptural church in Ephesus being confronted by a man that's saved, but he doesn't know anything about a church, church relationship at all. Doesn't know anything about it at all, nor about scriptural baptism. Do you think that they were baptizing? Yeah, they were baptizing. There's a lot of churches baptizing today, some by sprinkling. That's not baptism. That's Ron Teasel. Some by nepto pouring. That's not baptism. That's pouring. And some by dipping. But dipping is not enough. I can guarantee you that these people were dipped. Jews dip people and baptize people today, don't they? Without authority. It doesn't do them any good. It might give you a bath. You might get a little wet. Verse number 26 now, verse number 26. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. Now this man was a brave man. He would preach forth the truth in the synagogues, and what would these Jews do to these Christians? 
kill them, beat them, stone Paul to death, didn't they? So he's brave enough, and he knows what he's doing, and he goes in and he preaches in the synagogues. He confronts those Jews in the synagogues and tells them Jesus has come, the Messiah has come. Now, like I said, you read all these commentaries. Read all of them and just see what they say. They'll miss the boat every time. This is not talking about salvation. This is talking about scriptural baptism and church authority. Dr. John, it's good to see you here today. I missed you. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Verse number 27. What do you think more accurately was? Apollos, there's a church. Where did your church come from? How did you get over here? What's going on here? Because you're missing something. You don't have the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And when he uh, wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples. Who's the disciples? The church. To welcome him. And when he had arrived, he helped greatly those who had believed through grace. Did they believe? Well, how were they saved? By grace, which is the only means of salvation there is. The only means of salvation is saved by grace. All right, now, let's see what's going on. Verse number 28. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Half of these people say he didn't know Jesus is the Christ. He hadn't died yet. As far as he was concerned, no, he knew that. And he's confuting, refuting them. Where do you think Jesus is? I wonder if the commentators think Jesus is. How did he miss the boat? Do you think that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was a, was a mystery to Egypt? No. The crossroads and then highway went all the way from Jerusalem, from Galilee area, all the way down into Egypt. This news was carried back and forth and back and forth. It says, and the news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was noised abroad everywhere. Okay? So they, he knows that Jesus has died on the cross of Calvary, but he's missing something. He has an incomplete message. Many churches in the world today have an incomplete message. An incomplete message. And it came about that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus. 300,000 people are in Ephesus. This is, Paul liked to go to major cities because these people travel. So it, it evangelizes, they tell all the things. And when, when people would go from one synagogue to another, when they come from one area to the other, what would they would say, oh, you're a visitor, get up here and tell us what's something new. Even in the synagogues, they'd have my visitors come up and tell them what the news was. <clears throat> And he found some disciples, which is the church. How many ch does it take to make a scriptural New Testament church? Where there are two or three witnesses, I'm in the midst. Where are two or three to gather together in my authority. Remember that. That is not where two or three people gather, but that's two or three people gather as a church in authority. It took ten Jews to make a synagogue, didn't it? How many people does it take to make a church? Two or three to make a scriptural New Testament church with scriptural authority and scriptural baptism. This man didn't have it. Well, what's, what is that authority then? The authority came from, was handed down by Jesus to that church in Jerusalem, and every church they went out and handed it down, and they had the gifts of the Holy Spirit at this time. And these people were inspired. The pastors and deacons, all when they preached, they were inspired of God. All Apollos had was John's preaching. He didn't have the inspiration, but he was an eloquent man. And he's preaching the truth as far as he knew it. It was an incomplete message. So let's go on a little bit further. That's good. I got you thinking. I know those wheels are always burning. You listening? <laughs> <laughs> and he said to them, Do you, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now what does he say? Now, we know that when everybody from Adam to this side of the world, when we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit in us. No, we were triune. We're made of body, soul, and spirit. The Spirit of God comes and dwells in us as the Holy Spirit of God dwelling, branding, and earmarking every believer for the resurrection. And that's forever. It is immutable, indelible. 
marking. The Holy Spirit will never leave you. I even hit this with that guy the other night. Didn't phase him at all. He was not willing to lay it down. Now what happens to Apollos when he's approached and he's told the truth? Does he say, I got my own religion. I, I'm going to depend upon what I learned from John. I'm going to depend on the dogmas, the sacraments, and the Holy Catholic Church to get me to heaven. What's it say? What does he say now? He said, I believe in Luther. I believe in Calvin. I believe in uh, John Wesley. Minnell Simmons, whatever. And he said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now let's go back to Acts, the second chapter, real quick. <clears throat> Acts, the second chapter. It's the same book, see. Now when I, when I was there in Acts, the second chapter, I referred to this. But now when we're here, we have to refer back to that. All right? Arius, you don't get off the whole story. Acts 2 and verse number 37. Now, Peter preaches a great message in the first part of the book of Acts, or in the second chapter of the book of Acts. He tells them that they have crucified the Messiah, uh, uh, the God of heaven. And now when they heard this, they were pierced down deep in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles' brethren, What shall we do? And Peter said to them, Fraught. You remember what person that's in, Sharon? It's, 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 it is what? Second person plural is what? You all repent. That's plural. You all repent. Everybody needs to repent, don't they? Is that what Apollos was preaching? Repent and be saved and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and let each one of you be immersed. Scriptural authority of this church that was in Jerusalem right then. In the name, in the authority of Jesus Christ. Now it says for the remission of sins. Why is that word for the remission of sins? Why is it translated out there? Wait, Christine. The King James. The King James Bible believe that you're baptized for the remission of sins. They believe in baptismal salvation. There is no such thing as baptismal regeneration. Because. You're baptized because you're saved. Brother Bill. You know that got me. It means the sending away. In Greek, it says asaphasin. Asaphasin. And asaphasin means because of the sending away of your sins. You're baptized because of your sins. Now, all the early church history, you had to be a believer when you were sad. They all believed in believer's baptism. All Baptists believe in believer's baptism. You be, believe before you're baptized. And then you're baptized because you're a believer. Okay? That's what we call believer's Church baptism. Believes, what? Church of Christ believes. No, they're, no it's, that's opposite. You're baptized for the remission of sins. That's exactly what the Church of England believed when they translated 1611. But here it says you're baptized for the, because of the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive what? Now we, all right, now, we have two works of the Holy Spirit here. First of all, when you repent, and you ask the Lord to save your soul, you're indwelt with the Spirit of God. So here we have one work of the Holy Spirit. That's one work. Apollos had that work. That Holy Spirit was in him, even though he didn't understand all about it. The Spirit of God was in him, and he was sealed unto the Lord forever. Now we have another work of the Holy Spirit. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the gift of the Holy Spirit. What was the first gift of the Holy Spirit to the church? Apostles. And if you go into Acts, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, the 12th and 13th chapter, you'll see all of these church gifts. I wrote my master's thesis on what was called the near cult, and I talked about all of the gifts and how they were used in the churches. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and your children and for all who are far off and as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And the Bible says that God called all men to salvation, doesn't it? Now, in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, we have uh, Cornelius down there. Uh, he was a believer, but he's a Gentile. And God obeys his own rules. Do you know that? He obeys his own rules. Go 
God set down that the church would hand out authority to other churches to baptize. They would baptize believers. You will see that missionaries are sent out with the authority to baptize by the church beforehand. Now here we have a church in Joppa. In this church in Joppa, we have pre Peter over there preaching to them, don't he? He's an apostle, a very one sent out with divine authority. That's not what this word apostle means. And, and Peter is preaching in this church at Joppa, and here up in Caesarea, there on the Mediterranean Sea, we have Caesarea there, we have a guy over there that is a Gentile. And this Gentile, uh, he has had a vision from God, and he said, go up there, send messengers up to Joppa, to this scriptural church, and get Peter up there, because I'm giving him a message, as I'm giving you a message, go up there and you get church authority to come down here. And that's what he did. Peter was sent out by the authority of the church in Joppa, even though he was an apostle, to go down there, and he took people with him as representatives of that church. And the brethren went down to, to Caesarea with him, and they go down there, and they preached. And guess what old uh, Cornelius did? He believed, and everybody that was of age in his household believed. And it says that the Holy Spirit fell upon them now, this is backwards from normal, isn't it? The gift of the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Like it happened there on the day of Pentecost. This was the proof of the Holy Spirit falling upon these Gentiles because those Jews would have never added them to that Jewish church. So what did they do? They established a church, a Gentile church in Caesarea. Those Gentiles had the, after they voted, it says, Peter says, how can we forbid baptism of these people since we already see that God added them? And in Matthew the 18th chapter and Matthew the 16th chapter, what's it say about there? Whatever that church looses in heaven and earth and binds on earth will have already been what? Having been bound in heaven. So what we do on earth, some of the things we do on earth hadn't been bound in heaven. I can guarantee you that teetotally. Sometimes churches make mistakes. But when the church is following the Lord, what his, the church does has already been done in heaven. In other words, when we preach the gospel, people are saved. They get saved and they believe. They are added to the churches with scriptural baptism. That church, these people were baptized and that church was founded there. Those Jews didn't want to have anything to do with them. Remember when John Mark went with Paul on the, on the uh, uh, evangelistic tour? on his journey what happened to John Mark he wasn't a bad guy he was just prejudiced wasn't he he took off and went back to Jerusalem he didn't want to be rubbing elbows with all those dirty heathen dog Gentiles that were believing and Paul had it in for him from then on you know Paul got in trouble you know, we're all Adamic Paul was Adamic he may have been an apostle but he was Adamic you know he, he, he rubbed him the wrong way now let's go on a little bit further now, back into the, uh, the 19th chapter. <clears throat> and when they heard this, they argued, they griped, and they grumbled and said, we don't want to leave our old, old religion. Is that the truth? What did they say there? When they heard this, they said, wait a minute here, we already are baptized. Wait a minute here, we already have a church. What did they say? Don't you wish that every time you presented the gospel to somebody, they reacted like this? What's it say here? And when they heard this, they were baptized by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Now you have uh, people that are only baptized in Jesus' name. You ever heard about these Jesus' name? This is what we call, used to call them oneless wonders. You ever heard of the term oneless wonder? Brother, did you ever hear of that, brother? Brother Roger, oneless wonders? Oneless wonders. <laughs> these are churches, it's what we call oneness churches. In other words, uh, God was the Father here, and God was the Holy Spirit here, and God's the Son here, and there's only one God, period, and that's who he is right now. And right now, the only God we have to do with is Jesus. How many gods are there? 
Hear, O Israel, our God is Ahad. What's Ahad mean, Brother Roger? One. How many ones are there? One. That's singular, isn't it? There's only one God. He's triune. We're only one of us. We're triune. Number six. And when he had laid his hands upon them, now they were baptized. Now, in a scriptural New Testament church, they used to go, and they, a person will come forward, and they were saved. Maybe they were saved at home, and they come forward to the church later on. And they ask to become, they don't want to be baptized, and they want to become a member of that church. So somebody in the church, because the church is a democracy, a democracy, it's a democratic body, ecclesia, okay? One of the church members will say, I make a motion that we accept Roger on his profession of faith, and after baptism, he has full rights and privileges of the church, and not only that, after he's baptized, they get up there, and everybody lays hands on him. They shake his hand. And that authority and that Holy Spirit, that gift of the Holy Spirit, is passed on to that person. And that's what where it leads you into all truth. People outside of God's churches have some truth. Sometimes there's, many times they're saved. But how many people, how many commentators, these are religious people, these commentators, these are scholars, so-called biblical scholars that don't know what scriptural baptism is and church authority. You read all the different explanations of Apollos and you find out how many of them hit the nail on the head and how many of them don't. <clears throat> and when they heard this, they were all baptized in the name of the Lord by the authority of Jesus, by church authority. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began speaking with other languages and prophesying. Apollos was preaching the message of the Old Testament and the message that John had. He didn't have one word of New Testament theology, did he? Did he? But now Apollos is going to preach and he's going to prophesy and the things that he says are being canonized, basically, by the Spirit of God in each and every church. In other words, they're getting the truth, all the truth. And they're not only got the truth, but they have got the comforter. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the comforter and the leadership of the Holy Spirit are two different separate entities, works of the Holy Spirit of God. They started speaking with languages that they didn't have to learn. Now, these are all known languages. Uh, this is not unknown languages. This is not the gibberish that they use in Pentecostal ranks and, and all of the ranks that are being infiltrated in, in different places and all the churches. We have a very charismatic, friendly atmosphere in almost all churches today. Speaking with other languages and prophesying. The word prophesying means what? What's the word prophecy mean? I've been prophesying all morning. Teaching. Speaking forth. Speaking forth. Speaking forth the word of God. Let's go on a little bit further. And he entered into the synagogue and preached the same message, but with a whole lot more understanding and the Holy Spirit working in him and guiding him now to say the words that he said. Before, he was speaking on only the Old Testament scriptures, proving that Jesus Christ was the one that was to die. He believed that, didn't he? Did he? He preached Jesus and him crucified. <laughs> Death, burial, and resurrection. Salvation, people were saved. But now, he's preaching with the authority of God. That's something, people, to preach with the authority of God. On your own authority means nothing. I'll tell you what, when I preached... Uh, I've done a lot of preaching in my life. I preached about 6,000 messages that were recorded. And uh, there's a lot of people. In one family, there were 250 people saved out of Catholicism. In one family. And you can multiply that by a whole bunch. Now, these people were religious in Catholicism. There's nothing wrong with the Catholicism. It'll probably make you a better person. It probably will. It puts some control on you to some extent. Religions always, and, and, I, and I told this the other night, I said religions either bind you away from God or bind you to God. Some religions bind you away. 
I said, what you need to do is to know that Jesus Christ is the only way. There is one mediator between man and God. It's not Mary. It's not a priest. The Catholic Church, the priests are endowed, according to Catholicism, with the power to forgive sins. No man has power to forgive sins. Now, the Bible is God's rule of faith and order for us, isn't it? When I was talking to this man the other day, he said, I don't believe that the Bible is the only rule of faith and order. It's set aside. It's set aside. It's not that important. It's not the last word. The Pope is the last word. And things change. The Mormons, the Bible is only one little avenue of truth. The rest of it is in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrines, Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. The Pearl of you know the Bible is it that's it that's what we have that's the full order the full instructions that we have all the instructions he said he kept on uh, preaching in the synagogue and speaking out boldly for three months reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God now he understood about the kingdom of God didn't he that's different he didn't before now he understands the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Where is God's kingdom? Where does God's kingdom dwell today? Where does God rule in him alone? Where is that? Brother John, you know where that is? Brother Bill, Joanne, where does God rule absolutely? Where? No. Where does he rule? Where does he rule? Where? Heaven. He's on the throne in heaven. What is the physical manifestation and the administrator of the kingdom in the world today? Church. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The true New Testament church is that has scriptural fascinement and scriptural authority. You see that. That's where he, and that's the administrators of the kingdom of God, that spiritual kingdom. The real kingdom of God is in heaven. That's where he rules and reigns. All of the angels and all of the spirits and all the saved in heaven fall down and worship God. And he is there. They do obeisance to him because he is the ruler there. Who is a ruler of this world? Satan. Satan. He's a prince in the power of the air today. We are looking for that time when Jesus says, Come up here. And that he's going to set aside that old boy called Lucifer and Satan and Apollyon and all these other names the devil, the great liar, the murderer. He's going to set him aside. He's going to put him for 1,000 years. He's going to be out here in Revelation 27 through 9 in the bottomless pit. He's going to be chained up. All the influence on the earth. Why is the 1,000 year reign of Christ? Why is, why is it going to be? To prove to man that he's going to be bad no matter what without the devil. Always we say the devil made me do it. You made you do it. You made you do it. Even the saved people we do things that we're not supposed to do. We do that as saved people. But 1,000 years, there won't any be any Adamic, or I mean, not any Adamic, but it will be plenty of Adamic influence. There won't be any spiritual spirits to, uh, to lead men astray, nor Satan, but they will still be Adamically evil, and God will rule with a rod of iron during this period of time. Then at the end of the time, Satan's going to be loosed out here, and then we have what many people believe is the battle of Gog and Magog. That's where all the unbelievers on the earth unite together to fight against God one last time, and the Lord whips them and throws them forever in that lake of fire, Revelation 20 and 10. Going a little bit further in verse number 9 now. But when some were becoming uh, hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the what? The way. By the way, this is the first term for God's churches. It's called the way. The way. Now, was Apollos preaching about the way? He was preaching about the way of salvation, but he didn't know anything about the way of the church. But now he does, doesn't he? Now he knows the kingdom of God. And, and who is the administrator of God's kingdom in the world today? It's not Israel. Israel looks upon God as a national asset. 
We are the only ones that have the word of God. We are the ones that God gave the word to. But you know what? God set aside Israel. Israel is disobedient today. Israel was dispersed. Ezekiel 36, 16 through 19. They are regathered in Ezekiel 36, 20 through 24. And they're being regathered today. So we know that they're in the end time, don't we? Because God's getting ready to deal with those knuckleheads one last time. And the Bible tells us that five out of every six people on this earth are going to be killed. Islam has killed 270 million people so far. Catholicism killed between 50 and 100 million Baptists during their reign of terror. And they learned from each other, did they not? Those two terrible forces. And evidently, according to Islam, according to Islam, they say, and according to ISIS today, Islam is looking for the Mahdi. The Mahdi is going to come out of nowhere overnight. He's going to rule for seven years. This is Islam. I'm not telling you what, uh, what the Bible says. I'm telling you what Islam says. This is what the Quran, the Sunnahs, and the Hadith and the Ahadith say. They say that this Mahdi is going to come out and he's going to rule for seven years. And during this period of time, a beast is going to come forth. And this beast... After the, the Mahdi has got, uh, by the way, they're going to move the Kaaba to Jerusalem. They're going to build a big temple in Jerusalem. They're going to move the Kaaba. Uh, evidently, many Islamic, many Islamic sources say that there will be an atomic war had hit Mecca. And they're going to take that Kaaba stone and they're going to move it and build a temple in Jerusalem. And this Mahdi is going to go out. And this, according to the book of Revelation, now we, have a, we had a similar story in the book of Revelation. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says in the last days the Antichrist will come forward. And he will start, and he will build a temple in Jerusalem. And he will make a contract with the Jews and the world for how long? Seven years. Do you see similarities here? And that there will be a beast come out. And the beast is going to do, the beast of Revelation now, the book of Revelation. What's he going to do? The beast's going to do. He's going to mark all of those doomed with the name and the symbol of the Antichrist on their heads and on their fore, on their hands and on their head. The Mahdi is going to, according to the the Quran now and the Hadith, the the Mahdi is going to mark all the true Islamic believers with this: there is no God but Allah, and He has no companion. And Muhammad is the prophet of God. And then there's one other thing about the, the Quran and the Hadith. They talk about a Jesus coming back. After the Mahdi has come forward and after the beast has marked these and there's going to be devastation, what the Mahdi is going to do and what the beast is going to do, they're going to kill all these, all these people. Everybody that won't submit to Islam will be die dead. The Bible says five out of every six people is going to be killed. And the Bible says that two out of every three Jews are going to be killed. Okay? So we got the world devastated with death. Now the Mahdi and the beast, then they have their, the Jesus of Islam, which is a born of a virgin, Mary, but he, did, he, had, he is not the son of God. He does not forgive sins. He doesn't do anything of that at all, but he's going to come back and he's going to kill all the Jews. He's going to kill the Jews. There Jesus is. And then he's going to kill all the Christians. Then he's going to kill all the pigs. And he's going to reign for quite a while. The Bible says that the false prophet is coming, the Antichrist, that the beast is going to rise and mark all the unbelievers and they're for when they're marked, they're what? They're damned. Okay, they're damned. And then the false Jesus is going to come. But the Bible's Jesus is going to come back and save the Jews, isn't he? And he's going to rapture all of God's people. And it talked about all of these millions of people during here that are going to be killed for the name of Christ. When Noah sent the, when Noah built the ark and God shut the door, there was a lot of people on the outside of the ark believed, according to Peter. They were disobedient because they didn't get an ark. A lot of them on the outside believed, but it was too late, wasn't it? 
the judgment came. <clears throat> now, after the rapture, there's going to great, be a great judgment come upon this earth. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says that there's going to be a rapture. God's going to say, come up here and the church and all the saved and see if some people think the church is the saved or not. The church and the saved are two different entities. There's the family of God and the church. But all of those that believe in Jesus Christ that have believed in him and are saved, they get to go to heaven. Whether they even know whether they're saved or not. Some of these churches where they're saved, they don't have any security of believers. No security. They don't know whether they're saved. But these are going to be saved. And the bride is going to rule and reign with Christ, but there's going to be a lot of guests at the wedding. We talked about the Hebrew wedding the other night when I preached on that. And the church, the bride. The bride is going to be with the Lord. There's going to be a seven-year wedding feast. There's a seven-day feast in, in the Hebrew wedding, but this is a seven-year feast. It's seven years of tribulation upon the earth, and the Lord is going to save Israel right here in the middle of that three-and-a-half-year period of time. But there's going to be a whole lot of people die. They're all going to be beheaded. And it says the souls of them that were beheaded and killed and martyred are crying out, say, how long, Lord, how long? He said, what? A few more of your fellow brethren will be killed. What is, a, what is the form of execution at this period of time? What does the Bible say? It? Brother Mike, what's the form? Beheading. What does ISIS do? Behead. Just figure it out for yourself. You got both sides. Thank you for your attention. Today. So do you think, though, that that, that will happen before the rest? I think it will, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. Right now it's happening. But, so some of it's going to happen before the rapture. We got previews of coming attractions. Definitely, don't we? All right. Any other questions? Let me get these cameras shut off and everything, Bill. All right. Nothing? I've got a lot of questions. All right.